Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure to talk to you about population regulation. It's a part of a continuing discussion about how populations don't grow indefinitely. They may start off growing exponentially, but eventually they're limited by some sort of factors, and something is slowing their growth and causing their growth to be uh, declining. And so let me start off this conversation by drawing your attention to what I think is a very important concern. Like you may not be aware of some of these species that are in decline, but I just want to bring maybe one or two of them uh, to your attention. This little fellow right here is the mountain yellow legged frog, and it's of course an amphibian. And one of the things that you may be aware of is the fact that there's a lot of populations on the earth that are in decline. And when they're in decline, we give them different uh, conservation biologists, give them sort of rankings in terms of whether they're just endangered or if they're threatened, that sort of thing. And so what we're noticing is the amphibian population, the number of species are not, not only in decline, but they're collapsing. And so it's a real, real serious concern. And let me just bring one example to your attention. It happens to be this yellow-legged frog, as I was uh, talking about. Up in the Sierra Nevadas, um, there's these uh, these mountain lakes, and what's interesting is during the um, out of these 86 historic sites. So in other words, a lot, uh, several decades ago, biologists would come and they'd sort of survey to see what what organisms are living in, in these lakes. And so out of these 86 sites. When they went back again to visit these particular lakes uh, from the 1990 to 2010, only 16 of these sites contain these frogs. And so it's a real frightening disappearance of the yellow-legged uh, frog. And so this is sort of the habitat that the frog lives in. And so as it turns out, when you're hiking along uh, these sort of alpine, in other words, these high uh, elevation lakes, you um, you know, you might be charmed by these frogs jumping when they, when they see you coming from the meadow into the lake, and certainly in the evening you'll be able to hear them, the male croaking uh, that's going on. And so there's been a silencing. It, it's it's hard to even find these frogs, and so it's it's real concerning. And so today most of these frogs are gone, and so. Um, you know, this used to be one of the most common amphibians in the Sierra Nevada. And so we have some serious questions about conservation biology, like what, what's happening to this to species diversity? We're losing a lot of these amphibians. What's causing the decline? So as it relates to population regulation, like we need to ask some questions like why is the death rate increasing in these populations? And is it just death rate? And what's causing that? So, you know, why don't all populations or, or why do they all eventually stop growing or slow down? Why don't they just continue on forever and ever? What, and what are some of the factors that stop populations from growing and then ultimately cause their demise? Uh, and then, you know, the first step to examining that and answering those questions is to look at what happens when the population numbers get too large. And so let's begin by looking at that. Um, do you recall from our previous discussion, we talked about population growth, and let me refresh you the highlights. And so here you have a population growing rather slowly, and this is called the lag phase, and then it grows rather rapidly, exponentially, okay? And so we could illustrate this by mathematical equation and say that over here is N and over here is T. We could say that the, the change, the difference in the number of organisms over over the passage of time is equal to the growth rate, which is R, birth minus death per capita, times N, okay? And then over here we could add in the, this equation K minus N divided by K, and this is what gives us that logistic. And so let me change that uh, color. So it's this factor right here which is gonna cause the population to slow down. Now, why is it slow, slowing down? Because N is becoming so large that the, the growth rate will eventually slow down and it'll eventually reach what is what we call the carrying capacity, or K. 
it'll probably overshoot it and then undershoot it and oscillate it like this. And that's what we mean by carrying capacity, the number of organisms that the population can sustain. So what's causing this slowdown? What, what's causing it? Apparently, it's the high number of individuals. And so what is the relationship to high population numbers to decline? Now, what is it? And so it may be obvious. It may be obvious, like for example, when you consider a population like this, let's, let me redraw it. If you, call, if you look at this as n and this is t, and you do this, it grows exponentially and what's causing it to slow down like this. So what, what's happening up here at carrying capacity? What's happening at carrying capacity that's regulating the population? So when I say what's happening, it's like what we're really talking about is natural selection. We're talking about how organisms are adapted to living at carrying capacity and there's certain characteristics about them that need to be considered. And so let's take a look at this. So organisms that are living up here, and I say living up here, meaning that this isn't a short period of time. You could, you could have a population sustained at carrying capacity somewhat indefinitely. And so they could be living here for a long time. And so what we say about organisms that are living at carrying capacity is that they're K select, K meaning carrying capacity and select is short for natural selection. And so these organisms uh, live and die up in, in this really competitive so, sort of environment. And so they're sensitive to population densities. And what we mean by that is, is this. And so when you consider when an, organi when an organism is living up by carrying capacity, I can ask you a few questions about it and you might be able to predict. And it doesn't matter what particular species you're talking about because they have, all these case select organisms have these attributes in common. So in other words, if you're living up in that carrying capacity, if you remember that S-shaped curve, I can draw it again really quickly. It's like this and we go like this. So all the organisms that are living up here what do you think about their clutch size? Do you think they have few offspring or many, many, many offspring? The answer to that would be they have just a few offspring because again, things are very competitive and resources are limited. And so they have few offspring. And again, those who had a larger number of offspring, they may not be surviving. And so it's selection, natural selection results in a small, and get a small clutch size. How about the size of offspring? Well, natural selection up here, you'd want to have larger organisms. Larger organisms, for the most part, are stronger, um, potentially faster, and more. Um, they have just more traits that would allow them to be able to survive in a competitive environment. So they're large offspring. And so parental care. So up here, it's really competitive. Think of, for example, um, yourself and how, um, how long did it take you to be able to how old did you have to be in order for you to be able to completely be on your own and sustain yourself, be able to afford your own food and housing? And so, so therefore, parental care is long is and it's, and it's very good. You want to be able to teach your children to, to hunt. You want to teach them how to watch out for predators. You want to show them the, the way through education. So there's a big investment in parental care. And so this is, this is a very important one. You can sort of teach not, um, some of the lessons that you've learned in life, in life in order to help that organism survive. Reproductive age. Hmm. Should you start having children very early or wait till you're a little bit older and more established? And so reproductive ages are a little bit later in life for individuals that are K-select. Do most offspring survive? The answer would be yes. If you remember from a previous discussion that this organisms that are K select have a type one survivorship curve, meaning that most of the offspring are going to survive and then survive throughout their life and then die when they're a little bit older. The ability to compete, very competitive up here because again, resources are limited and so you have to be on your toes. Size of the adults, again, very large. And so I find that to be very interesting. And so, you know, like, well, is that the only, uh, is that the only thing when organisms are living up in carrying capacity? And so what would you make of this? How about if I said, 
that you have n over here and t over here. And let me just draw, draw this in, okay? Here's that, what we were just talking about, sort of k-select, like that. What would you say, let me change the color, what would you say if I have a different population that's growing just like this, it's growing like this, and then all of a sudden it crashes? And so it's booming here at first, and then it crashes, and you're like, well, wait, wait a minute, it's not reaching carrying capacity. Why, why is that happening? And then it grows again, and then it crashes. And then it grows again, and then it crashes, and it grows again, and it crashes. It never seems to even be close to carrying capacity. You're like, well, wait a minute. Well, there's many organisms, very, very many species of organisms on the Earth that are never going to reach the carrying capacity. And it's not, it's not density that regulates their growth. It's not the density. It's density independent factors that are regulating its growth. And you're like, well, what do you mean? Well, these organisms in blue are what we're going to be calling R select, as opposed to up here, we call these K select organisms. These are the R select organisms. The, they exhibit sort of the opposite effects that we were just talking about before. I don't have to bring the list up, but they exhibit very little parental care. Their organisms are very small. They're not very competitive. They have a very short generation time. They're very fragile. Um, they grow, and the, like the, the parents have all these offspring, so it's type three survivorship. A lot of them die, but when they do survive, they're cruising up like this, and then something's causing their demise. And then they, then they grow up again really fast, and something causes their demise. But it's not it's not limited resources. I wonder what it could be. I wonder what's causing that. And so as it turns out, you get these two different things going on. You get these organisms that are like going up and down, fluctuating. These are the R select. And then these guys are the K select that are hanging out at carrying capacity. These organisms, K select, are regulated by density dependent factors What's regulating these guys are, is not related to density. It might be something that has nothing to do with density. So we call the factors that regulate this population density independent factors. And so what we're about to do is I'm going to give you some examples of what do, what do we mean by density dependent factors that regulate case select and what, do you, what are some examples of density independent factors that regulate our select organisms. Let's look at that. And so density dependent factors. So again, I, I draw the graph, you know, but here's some real examples, like here's paramecium and daphnia and even some birds that are up here. So density dependent factors, like what are these things? Well, it's sort of like negative feedback. And what I mean by that is as the numbers get really high, it's the high number of individuals that are actually causing the negative feedback. This is an example of negative feedback. Think of negative feedback as when it gets um, very cold in the room, the heater comes on, and then when it gets too hot, then the heater turns off, and then it gets cold, and the heater turns on. And so it's, it's the temperature that's sort of regulating it. When it's too hot, it or when it's too cold, it turns it on. And so this is an example of negative feedback. So density dependent factors are negative feedback and density independent factors, the ones that show no concern of what the population size is, is why it's called independent of density, density independent factors. And so what are these? So here they are in this one, in this one picture here. So Density dependent factors could be territoriality. In other words, there is competition for territory. And so, you know, what, why? Because organisms need to have a little bit of space in order to find their food. And they need maybe they're, they're territorial about their breeding, breeding habitat. And so there, that is going to limit whether or not they're going to be able to reproduce. And so that's related to density. And so predation, if you get a bunch of uh, predators coming into the area, that's going to be a density dependent factor as well. Competition between the organisms, now this is intraspecific, so within the species, they're competing over whatever the places to live, 
um, food, water, sunlight, whatever resources that they're, they're uh, vying for. Competition is a big one. This is an interesting density dependent. When the numbers get really high, it doesn't always work out just for penguins, but I'm just saying. It's like another example of waste accumulation is like, for example, if you're if you have a, um, a flask and you're growing yeast, and so the, the yeast population is growing and growing. So picture this being the S-shaped curve. It's growing and growing, and then suddenly it starts declining. Why is it? Well, it could be they're running out of resources, but some of the factors that prevent the population from growing exponentially is the fact that when yeast are fermenting, they're producing alcohol, ethanol, and that that's a waste, and the, the waste accumulation is actually, actually detrimental, and it will actually cause the population to start to decline and die. And then disease, the fact that the populations are very large, you know, diseases are contagious, mostly, and so if organisms are sick and the population is large, more individuals are going to have more contact with one another and therefore diseases will spread and therefore the population will decline. So all of these things are regulatory factors that organisms up at carrying capacity are the reason why the population slows. Now these density independent ones, like for example, like if you're a little ant or something in your or some beetle in the forest and then suddenly lightning strikes and a big forest fire comes that's going to wipe out your population so if do you remember this this was those populations that exhibit sort of they're growing and then ah they drop fire <laughs> or they could be seasonal you grow and then it and then the winter time you die and then the winter time you die and the winter time you die and so these fluctuations that we see are not related at all to population size. They're nowhere near carrying capacity. So things like weather, fire, storms, it even could be something like human. Like for example, you could have a big decline in bird population and you're like, whoa, what's going on? Maybe they're competing. Maybe they're, they're running out of food. No, there was a big oil spill that wiped them almost all out. And so it's independent of, of density. So I think that that's uh, pretty clear. Another cool thing that can happen in populations is that they could cycle like predator and prey. Like this is a classic right here. Look at the numbers here, 1850 to 1925. And so again, you're like, wow, ecologists are really into this, like been studying population growth in, in uh, these bunnies and in the lynx. Now it's what, what we're actually measuring here is the number of of pelts because we like the, the fur of these organisms. And so what's interesting is, check it out, uh, the hare is obviously the predator. So when the predator is in high numbers, like snowshoe hare, the, the lynx is like, ah, oh, lots to eat, lots to eat. I'm eating and growing, eating and growing, eating and growing. And then, uh oh, the hares are declining, declining, declining because there's so many predator. And when the predator is really high, the prey almost goes down to, to nothing. And when there's no more prey, there's no more food for the predator. And so it this correspondingly drops. And then when there's no more predator, oh, the, the hares start coming back again. And then the predator starts coming back. And so these two oscillate side by side. And so these are known as predator-prey cycles. And so take a look at this one. Can you tell which one's predator, which one's prey? Or does it matter? This is a good question. And so check this out. So let me get some, some colors here. Let's go yellow. So watch this. What would you say if this is like the prey? And as the prey goes up like this, the prey is doing really, really well. And then what? The predator is then, you know, eating, 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 eating. When the predator gets so high, then the prey is going to what? Drop down. And then you can sort of see what happens. Then the predator drops down and then the prey goes up and then the predator drops down and the prey goes up. So they, they're related to one another. So population cycles. And so um, one of the last things that I wanted to mention in terms of, of population is that um, it can leave you, when you talk about populations, it can leave you a little bit negative, especially thinking, especially when you're thinking, well, when a population size gets really large, this, this is going to be trouble. They're going to be fighting territoriality, competition, waste accumulation, disease, it's all about competition over resources, very negative. But there's a professor um, 
that came along, uh, his name was Ali, and he, he coined this frame, the Ali effect. And so what this is all about is that when a population size is very large, it actually can be beneficial to the group. So it's a little positive, meaning that like here you have these hyenas here and it's like an individual hyena is not going to be able to take down this, this wildebeest. It can't survive on its own. It can only survive when the population is large enough. And then you also have to throw in uh, social behavior that they work cooperatively. But you get my point that they're only going to be able to do well when the numbers are really high. And same with these pelicans. If a pelican sort of was a rogue and was living all by itself, it may not be able to catch fish. But notice here when they're working together in a large group, they can form like this little net and actually be able to pick off all the fish. Like it's a little fishing uh, circle right here. Pretty cool. And so, um, again, these wild dogs in the savannah in Africa, it would be difficult for them to survive individually. So they work together in, in large groups. So that's an advantage of a, of a large population size, the Ali effect. And then more examples. I had an opportunity to look this up. It's pretty interesting. Um, here's a really cool one. Like, okay, so these are tadpoles. And do you notice how their dorsal side is dark? So when the sun is shining down in these pools, um, the dark uh, coloration actually helps to absorb the sunlight and it actually starts warming the water. And you're like, wait a minute. Like that's not happening. Well, if the numbers of tadpoles are so huge, it really will start warming the water up and you're like well what's that going to do well as it turns out is, is it was studied that the warmer the water is it increases the metabolic rate of the uh, the transition from the tadpole to the frog to the metamorphosis that goes from the tadpole to the frog and so therefore it speeds up that process and then they're able to survive a little bit better <laughs> how's that for a lee effect that's a pretty cool one and so I want to conclude. Whoops! I want to conclude with taking a look at um, this short animation. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I'm just going to let it play, if you don't mind. I'm not going to really talk over it. But it's a really cool animation from our uh, our textbook that I think that it, it sort of summarizes what we've been talking about. Let's zoom in to St. Paul Island in Alaska, where reindeer were introduced in 1911. We can look at the size of the reindeer population over time using a graph. The horizontal axis shows time, and the vertical axis shows population size, the number of reindeer. The population increased when the birth rate was greater than the death rate. The population decreased when the death rate was greater than the birth rate. Now, let's look at the pattern of growth in this reindeer population. At first, the reindeer had plenty of food. The population grew slowly, and then grew faster and faster as the population got bigger. This pattern is exponential growth, which occurs when a population has unlimited resources. Our time of down. course, resources are never truly unlimited. As the reindeer population exploded, food ran out, and the population crashed. Exponential growth cannot continue forever. That's density dependent. K minus N divided by K. St. Paul Island is also home to fur seals. When seal hunting was reduced, the population grew in a way that initially resembled exponential growth. But as growth continued, some individuals <laughs> could not find suitable breeding space, and the birth rate declined. Eventually, the birth rate equaled the death rate, and the population reached carrying capacity, the maximum population size the habitat can support. This pattern is logistic growth. These are case select organisms as well, so you can predict a little bit about those seals. In Lake Superior, 
Ile Royale is home to moose, whose population size is shown in red, and wolves, whose population size is shown in blue. As wolves preyed on moose, the moose population crashed and wolf numbers increased. But with fewer prey, the wolf population also crashed. This allowed the moose population to rebound. This pattern of interrelated ups and downs is sometimes seen in predator-prey situations. Some factors that limit population size depend on the density of the population, how many individuals occupy a certain amount of space. Density-dependent factors include limited food, limited breeding space, and predators. Density-independent factors do not depend on population density. For example, an oil spill affects all the birds in the area, regardless of their density. Population ecology helps us understand human population growth and where we might be headed next. They're kind of interesting. Um, they didn't mention all the factors like, like storms or fires, and they didn't mention waste accumulation for density dependent. But I find that to be pretty cool, and it, it's, a, it's a pretty neat animation. Well, I hope you enjoyed our video on population regulation. I hope it was informative. Thanks for watching.